May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Matthew's account of Jesus' baptism records a pivotal moment at the beginning of Jesus' story. And the location is no accident. John preached from the wilderness, rejecting the claims of a political and social order in order to reach back to Israel's heritage. After all, the Israelites had wandered for 40 years in a wilderness, and it's from that place that John spoke. But in light of a recent news release, this moment at the River of Jordan in Jesus' lifetime stands in stark contrast to what has been done to the land near the River Jordan today. Quote, Efforts to clear thousands of landmines and other ordnance around the site where many believe Jesus was baptized have reached a milestone, and officials allow a rare glimpse of abandoned churches there. The church grounds around the site in the occupied West Bank have sat empty and decaying for around 50 years, though pilgrims have been able to visit a nearby restricted area at the traditional baptismal spot on the banks of the Jordan. Work at the site, just north of the Dead Sea, is being overseen by Israel's defense ministry, the demining charity, Halo Trust, and an Israeli firm. According to the ministry, the project covers around one square kilometer, 250 acres, as well as some 3,000 mines and other explosive remnants. So a scene of hope and promise in Matthew's Gospel, a scene which recalls the promise of peace and justice on the earth, is marked by a sign of violence and conflict in today's Middle East. How are we to connect these two ways of thinking about this sacred space? The question, I think, is what kind of power do we believe is at work in the kingdom of God? In Matthew's account, Jesus protests John protests Jesus' desire to be baptized by him. John says, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. John's reluctance to baptize Jesus has nothing to do with his perception or not of Jesus being sinless but rather to Jesus' greater status related to the kingdom of God. According to John, John should be Jesus' disciple, not the other way around. But by submitting to John's baptism, the greater to the lesser, Jesus is showing us in action something about the nature of God's reign. God's reign is not imposed from above. It's not a lording over, as the Gentiles do. God's reign moves from the bottom up and is demonstrated when the greatest are the least and the servant of all. His kingdom doesn't come from halls of power or Rome or Jerusalem, but from the margin, in the wilderness, near the Jordan, in solidarity not with the religious elite or powerful, but in solidarity with those who find themselves exiled. This sort of reign finds its ultimate expression in death on a Roman cross. This kind of reign begins with the greater submitting to baptism by the lesser. The theology of God, enfleshed in history, communicates both that divinity stoops down to humanity in a direct and personal way, and that humanity is caught up in the divine condescension so as to be elevated, transformed, perfected. What the incarnation of God in Christ communicates 
is that the relationships that constitute creation do not achieve their perfection until they approximate the intimacy and care which marks the relation between God and creation. So what way of life are we invited to follow, we who believe in following Jesus? Consider the questions that we are asked when we are baptized or when we reaffirm our baptismal vows. Will you persevere in resisting evil? And whether you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord. Hard question. Evil is real and difficult to resist. The forces of hatred, fear, and violence at work around us often tempt us. They tempt us to become angry or sometimes to despair. They tempt us to believe that the only way to overcome these forces is by counter-violence, or to simply withdraw from the world as much as we can and be alone. But we are not asked to combat evil. Surprise, isn't it? Christ has done that on the cross for us. But, okay. What we are called to do is to persevere in resisting evil and to recognize when we have failed and seek God's forgiveness. And so the second question, will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? How does my life, how does our life together reflect good news? Are we truly a sign of the inbreaking of grace peace, and love in this world? And then the harder question. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? The banner outside our church reminds us of exactly what that means and how hard it is. You've seen it many times. Love your neighbor who doesn't look like you, doesn't think like you, doesn't love like you, speak like you, or pray like you, or vote like you, love your neighbor. No exceptions. That's what it means to follow Jesus, to love without exception and resist the temptation to put people in categories. And then the last question. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people? and respect the dignity of every human being? It's a hard question. In the process of seeking justice and peace, in a world which often sees peace as weakness and justice as an illusion, we are called to resist the temptation to think of those who embrace violence and hatred as subhuman and dismiss them with a vulgarism, which I'm not going to quote from the pulpit. But you know I mean. Removing the 3,000 mines and other explosive remnants buried beside the Jordan River is a necessary first step toward God's peace and justice. Removing the reasons that led people to put those mines there, that's what it means to seek and serve Christ in all persons loving your neighbor as yourself. Amen.